Hello and welcome to Sleep Reviews webinar, Understanding the PAT Signal and Watch PAT Recordings and Scoring. Sleep Review is pleased to be here with Alan Schwartz, MD. After his presentation, he'll answer your questions. Submit questions anytime via the Q&A box on your screen. We also have the advanced questions submitted on the webinar registration screen. So when we get to the Q&A segment, we'll lead with those. This webinar is brought to you by Itamar Medical. For a certificate of attendance, which is available for the live webinar only, you must meet a few criteria. You must watch the webinar on its original air date of October 29th at about 12 noon Pacific time for about 60 minutes, for at least 60 minutes. Uh, you must complete the course evaluation, which will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar or when you personally leave the event, whichever is earlier. Even if you don't need a certificate, we'd appreciate it if you give us your feedback via the evaluation. If you are watching as a team, you need to register separately now if every team member wants their own certificate. Everyone who meets these criteria will receive a certificate in their email within the next 30 days. For AAST webinars only, we'll also submit your one continuing education credit directly to AAST. We are trying a new automated certificate delivery program, so we are hoping that certificates actually send later today. If you do not get a certificate within 30 days and you think you met the criteria, then email sroy at medcore.com. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. It will also be available for new registrants to watch on GoToWebinar for the next three months. But the recorded version is not eligible for the certificate of attendance. I am now happy to introduce Alan Schwartz, MD. As professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University for over 30 years, Dr. Schwartz paid a pivotal role in building the Johns Hopkins Sleep Disorder Center. He launched and directed the Sleep Medicine Fellowship Training Program and the Center for Interdisciplinary Sleep Research and Education. Dr. Schwartz graduated from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, completed his residency in internal medicine at Mount Sinai Medical Center, and fellowship in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He is currently an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine and distinguished visiting professor at Kieitano University in Lima, Peru. Welcome, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you very much, and thanks to the conference organizers. Uh, very much appreciate uh, all of your interest and, and attendance this afternoon, and hope to uh, also answer any questions at the end of the uh, at the end of the formal presentation. We're going to be uh, talking about the WatchPad as a home testing device for sleep apnea, but as we'll see, it's got a lot of potential. The potential is really based on the fundamentals, and so this is an opportunity for us to really review the fundamentals of WatchPad recording technology and how you can look at the studies, put it into your clinical routine, and use it to, uh, to ramp up or uh, expand your overall sleep center operations and diagnostic capabilities. A lot of the material that will be discussed will be referring indirectly to a project that we did at Johns Hopkins, which was called the Compass Project. And that was a formal comparison of WatchPat recordings to sleep studies in the laboratory. That publication has recently come out and is available to you and is referenced on the screen. By way of disclosures, I have been involved as a paid consultant to Itamar, as well as to a bunch of other uh, medical technology companies in the uh, sleep disorder breathing space. In addition, we're doing sponsored research in which we're, we're looking at a number of these technologies in the laboratory, including NIH-sponsored research. What I'd like to do is really the major goal of this hour is really to outline the uh, structure, a structured approach for reading the WatchPAT study. Now, the approach that we'll outline is really based on the following uh, sort of tenets. First, we'll review the WatchPAT technology. Then we'll describe an approach for evaluating the hypnogram and the sleep disorder breathing patterns on the WatchPAT device. From our global view of the WatchPAT report, hypnogram and sleep disorder breathing, we will identify some salient features on these reports that lead us to target areas for greater scrutiny on the recordings themselves. And we'll get an example of one or two cases in which we're actually recapitulating this process, starting with the report and diving into the recording. 
And then we will summarize the impact of visual overreading on the ultimate results that you render on a WatchPat report. And we'll summarize those by way of summarizing the results of the COMPASS study. Well, to start, I'd like to really remind you that WatchPad itself is based on peripheral arterial tonometry. The peripheral arterial tonometer is a measure of vascular pressure in the blood vessels in the finger. And when you see a pulse of blood coming into the finger from each systole, each heartbeat, the change in volume at the fingertip is a reflection of the pulse pressure and the degree to which the arterioles expand with each systole. Well, the finger is wrapped in a probe that provides a small amount of counter pressure. And we'll see that the watch pad itself, or the PAT signal, is based on the probe technology, which includes two components. One is the finger wrap that applies that uniform counter pressure around the finger and the photoplethysmography signal from the oximeter. And that's shown here in the middle of the slide where the oximeter throws off a plethysmography signal that is used in conjunction with the counter pressure to render a pulsatile waveform that reflects the overall tone in the arterial or the pulse volume with each heartbeat. And it's because of these two components that the PAT signal is able to increase its signal to noise ratio by preventing venous pooling at the fingertip. And as a result, it increases the sensitivity in detecting subtle degrees of vasoconstriction in the arterial as might occur with a microarousal from sleep. The vasoconstriction is mediated by an adrenaline surge or an increase in sympathetic activity. And it's this pulsatile waveform that we'd like to look at the dynamics of that waveform a little bit more closely. The question is, what is the effect of the low level counter pressure that's provided by the probe, which optimizes the PAT signal sensitivity? And I'll remind you once again that the pulse pressure generates a change in volume in the finger jacket itself. But that change in volume depends on the stiffness of the arterioles in the finger. Normally, when there's no pressure around the finger, the arterioles are relatively dilated without any counter pressure around the finger itself. And it's the fact that those arterioles are distended that a given systole, in other words, a given change in pulse pressure during the heartbeat leads to a very, very small change in volume when the arteries are already quite dilated. But that little bit of counter pressure that we apply around the arteries in the finger jacket leads to slight degrees of vasoconstriction or compression of the arterial. And so the same change in pulse pressure with each heartbeat leads to a marked increase in the volume of the finger. And it's as a result of that, that this particular configuration, counter pressure plus pulse volume, leads to a signal that is greatly amplified relative to the native signal that you get from just the photoplethysmography itself without the counter pressure in the probe. And it's as a result of these dynamics that the counter pressure prevents venous pooling around the fingertip and other vasoconstrictive reflexes that can result. It also maintains contact between the SpO2 probe and the finger, which decreases the motion artifact. There's a reduction in physiologic noise that decreases respiratory artifact that's transmitted through the vasculature to the finger. 
the reduction in arterial wall tension as a result of a slight degree of vasocompression leads to increased sensitivity in detecting the pulsatile changes in volume. And a unique feature is the probe itself self-inflates to a fixed level of bladder pressure that is just below diastole, meaning that the probe itself is not affected by the size of the patient's finger. Now, it's as a result of that that the PAT signal and its probe is the backbone of this technology that folds into the WatchPad device. The WatchPad really consists of three components. The first is a button that sticks to the upper chest or manubrium. And it's invested with a body position sensor, a snoring microphone, and a chest motion sensor. The second component is the wristwatch itself which has embedded in it an actigraphy unit that detects body movements and motion. And then finally, the PAT probe itself throws off the arterial tonometry signal in conjunction with standard oximetry and the oximetry signal, the photoplethysmography signal, or the PAT signal, is used to generate a heart rate in beats per minute. And so it's from this probe that we get the pulsatile signal, which provides us an index of vascular tone that is very sensitive to microarousals from sleep. But the signal itself is processed to generate the heart rate, as well as the oximeter that's embedded in the probe itself. The PAT signal is an index of vascular tone and is really used to provide us the footprints or fingerprints of sleep disorder breathing episodes shown here. In that apnea is an hypopnea that might result from upper airway obstruction or from central events lead to microarousals from sleep. And we see evidence of these microarousals from the PAT signal in the bottom two signals on this three-minute three recording. What we see here is that at the end of these apneic episodes, the apneic episodes terminate with a marked attenuation in the PAT signal. The attenuation indicates that the vessels in the finger have vasoconstricted. Now that vasoconstriction that we see here with PAT amplitude attenuation is associated with a concomitant rise in pulse rate. And it's the combination of a drop in pad amplitude and an increase in pulse rate that gives us what we will call the reciprocal pattern. And the reciprocal pattern indicates that there has been an, a surge of adrenergic activity or sympathetic activation that indicates that a microarousal has occurred. What makes that arousal more specific to detecting sleep disorder breathing episodes is the fact that it is associated with some disturbance in respiration. And we see here that we're able to confirm the microarousals are each associated with a significant desaturation. But the disturbance in respiration may also be provided by the respiratory motion sensor or the snoring sensor, as we'll see down the line. And it's the combination of this respiratory dis disturbance that terminates in a microarousal that WatchPAT uses to automatically detect apneic and hypopneic episodes. But WatchPAT goes one step further in that the PAT signal is crucial in WatchPAT's ability to assess total sleep time and to stage sleep in non-REM and REM components. And so when WatchPAT counts up the apneic and hypopneic episodes, it's always dividing by the sleep time, not by the total recording time. And it's on that basis 
Watchpack's ability to both detect the disorder breathing event, as well as assess total sleep, non-REM, and REM time, that Watchpack generates an accurate representation of the overall apnea hypopnea index. And Watchpack stands in contradistinction to most other home testing units which may count up the disorder breathing events, but divide those events by total recording time rather than total sleep time. And because recording time is always greater than total sleep time, the ability of these devices to detect and classify patients with mild, moderate, and severe sleep apnea is somewhat reduced or less sensitive than the WatchPad device. Now, how does WatchPad do this? WatchPad, as mentioned, generates its own computer-generated automated report. It inserts score tags for apneic episodes, it stages sleep and renders a complete sleep hypnogram from which you can observe the sleep architecture. And as mentioned, it generates the sleep disorder breathing episode from its ability to detect the disturbances in respiration in association with the microarousal pattern. The automated process generates a computer generated report that you see here. And the report consists of two components the graphic display on the bottom of this page and the tabular data, which summarize what you can glean from the graph. We're going to look at these graphs in somewhat more detail, because these graphs are going to be our roadmap for verifying and editing the recordings themselves. And in most instances, we will end up verifying the results that are reported in the tabular data. But there are instances in which we will use these graphic displays as a roadmap for targeting areas of greater scrutiny that we may want to edit as we dive into the recording itself. And when we do so, we're able to modify the automated tag on the recording and push with a push of a button, generate the final report that we deliver to the referring physician. And it's this two-step process of letting the computer do most of the work while we sweep in at the end, either verify or edit the automated result that provides us a really secure and confident diagnosis that we can make. The process that I've just described really just starts with the automated report the automated scoring generates a hypnogram and sleep disorder breathing event that we will do a visual cost check on. And then from there, we may either verify the hypnogram and sleep disorder breathing assessment or target the areas for greater scrutiny in either the hypnogram or the sleep disorder breathing event before we generate our final report. Now, our ability to analyze the graphic display on the report depends really on our ability to describe the waveforms and the signals that we see. And in this slide, you see a slight brief primer that really gives us the vocabulary that we need to describe the physiologic signals on the report itself. And those signals consist of at signal, the pulse, and the oximetry characteristic. Now, all of these physiologic signals we'll describe in two dimensions. One is the overall amplitude, and the other is the frequency content of the signal. Amplitude is easy. It's either high, intermediate, or low, as you see here in the case of sinus tachycardia when the signal is high, or bradycardia when the signal is low. But these signals also, this signal also has another characteristic, which is its variability. In this case, 
these signals are not variable in the top panel. And we'll describe that signal that has low variability as a stable or steady signal. In contrast, we have two other forms of higher degrees of variability in these signals, which we'll describe as either regular variability or irregular. The regular variability is more or less periodic or oscillating in nature, as might be the case with someone who has sinus arrhythmia, where the heart rate speeds up and slows down with each cycle of the respiratory rhythm. Irregular variability is really noisy and non-periodic or chaotic. And this kind of variability has a lot of sort of chaotic noise that overrides the overall signal level. But despite this variability that we see that's quite irregular, we can still describe the overall signal as being high, intermediate, or low in its amplitude. And so every signal, no matter how variable it might be, and no matter how, what kind of frequency content it holds, can always be described by the overall amplitude as well as the patterns of variability. And it's with this vocabulary that I'd like to highlight or illustrate how WatchPat actually stages sleep and how you can sweep by afterwards and confirm WatchPad sleep staging. Now, this is an example of a one hour recording where we can stage the sleep in blocks of roughly 20 minutes. It's divided into three parts, this recording, at the vertical dashed line. We see our standard montage, which consists of tactigraphy, body posture, snoring, SAO2 the raw path signal, which is highly compressed in this panel. The derived path is the moving average or envelope of the raw path signal. And then the pulse rate, which is the beat to beat amplitude that's averaged out to give you an overall level of pulse rate. And as we look at these three segments of this one hour record, we can see that the path amplitude is relatively high in the first and in the third panel compared to the second panel. In other words, the amplitude is up. But we also see different patterns of variability in this signal, where the variability in the first panel is relatively regular and periodic, up, down, seesawing, or oscillating amplitude are a regular form of variability. Whereas in the second part here, when the signal takes a nose dot, we also see that the variability changes in pattern and becomes much more irregular in the middle panel. By the last panel, the signal amplitude once again goes up and that same type of periodic or oscillating regular variability begins to return. Well, the patterns that we're describing of high amplitude and regularity of the signals in the first and the third pattern are really characteristic of non-REM sleep. And indeed, that is the case because non-REM sleep is characterized by relatively high PAT amplitude compared to REM sleep where the PAT amplitude goes down. But the other characteristic of REM sleep is that autonomic control of the vasculature and the heart rate becomes highly erratic and irregular. And we see that both in the PAT signal here as well as in the heart rate signal, where we can see that there's a lot of erratic or irregularities of both the heart rate and the PAT signal that in addition to the drop in PAT amplitude, tell us for sure that this patient is in REM sleep. And then the patient pops out of REM sleep with a small arousal. That arousal is associated with a surge of sympathetic activity or vasoconstriction that leads to a marked drop once again in the pad amplitude and an increase in the pulse rate. 
But as the patient glides off again into non-REM sleep, the pad amplitude goes back up again to the non-REM level, and the variability in autonomic control, pulse and amplitude, becomes much more, much less and or much more regular. And so you can easily glean just from one hour segments of the watch pat recording, you can easily distinguish, grossly speaking, the non-REM, REM, and wakeful period. And so this is a very different style from the usual form of epoch by epoch sleep staging that we often um, apply to a polysomnogram itself. Well, let's apply these signal these principles to an unknown record here on the left-hand panel. And what we see here is the typical display on a watch pat report, where we see in the top pane the snoring and the body position in the black line. The oximetry is shown here in the middle panel, pulse rate in red, and we'll see the hypnogram in a moment below at the bottom pane. You can easily see in this panel that there are a few periods here where pulse rate becomes much more irregular and the variability becomes much greater. As well, the variability and the level of the oximetry changes. The oximetry becomes more variable and the oxygenation goes down a teeny bit. And you see the irregularity and the changes in amplitude here. In this case, in the first third of the night here, the second third of the night once again here, and in the last portion of the night, we can see that the variability in the pulse and the variability in oxygenation increases once again. And it's because of this increase in variability that's occurring roughly every two hours over the course of the night, as well as the changes in signal amplitude that we see in the oxygenation, that we can logically infer that these might well be three REM periods occurring roughly every couple of hours. And in fact, that's what WatchPat returns as the REM periods or the REM cycles for this patient that are easily sort of picked out visually as you look at the report, the graphic display on the report from a high level. And it's really based on watch pat's ability to discriminate non-REM, REM, and wakefulness that we can see things on a watch pat report that are otherwise inaccessible from other home testing platforms. Namely, we can pluck out with our eyes two very characteristic patterns of sleep disorder breathing. Now in the left-hand panel, we see an example of positional sleep apnea. Looking just at the oximetry signal over the course of the night, we can see that the oximeter itself has several periods here of intermittent hypoxia that's really characteristic of sleep disorder breathing episodes. And the intermittent hypoxia is associated with increased variability in the pulse rate itself. That variability in pulse rate, along with the intermittent hypoxia, confirms that we're really having microarousals that are accompanying frequent sleep disorder breathing episodes. But these clusters of sleep disorder breathing occur in this patient only when the patient is on his side, here, here, and here, but not only when the patient is on his back and not when the patient is on his side. And you can see that every time the patient rolls to his side, the snoring goes away, the oximetry stabilizes, and the heart rate variability goes down dramatically. But even under that positional effect, the heart rate variability increases somewhat once again during the REM period. And in this REM period, you can see not only increased variability, but a rise in the heart rate itself, indicative of increased 
sympathetic drive or activation during REM sleep compared to non-REM. But you can easily see that the pronounced areas of intermittent hypoxia with microarousals from sleep and snoring are most closely associated with the positional change, hence making the diagnosis of positional sleep apnea almost uh, a sure bet. Now we see a similar pattern of clustering of desaturations in the right-hand panel, but these clusters are not related to changes in body position. These clusters of apneic activity are actually related to REM sleep cycles here, 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 and here. And it's based on the appearance of REM apnea, REM sleep disorder breathing, that we can conclude that the clusters themselves are REM, represent REM-related sleep apnea rather than positional sleep apnea. And so looking at these graphic displays, you're already visually predicting what the tabular data on the reports will show. And indeed, the tabular data will show you that this patient has on the left an AHI in the supine position that is quite high, but an AHI that's very low in the side position. And that opens the gate to the possibility of deploying positional therapy. In the case of the patient on the right, you expect to see from this graphic display, you expect to see a high AHI in REM sleep, but not in non-REM sleep. And if you don't find what you expect to see, then it's going to raise a question that would warrant a deep dive into the recording to find out what's really going on. Well, our ability to discriminate differences in apneic activity by sleep stage also gives us a unique hook that allows us to distinguish obstructive from central or chain stoke breathing patterns. And we see that in these two graphic displays here, where the distribution of the apneic episodes between non-REM and REM sleep help us distinguish a patient who has obstructive from central sleep apnea. Look for a moment at the top panel here, where you once again see the graphic display patient goes off to sleep in the first hour and develops really severe sleep apnea as manifested by the profound intermittent hypoxia. But you can see that at, as, at three, during three of these four REM episodes, you see more pronounced desaturations here, here, and here. And those deeper desaturations during REM sleep are pretty typical of a patient who has obstructive, not central sleep apnea. Why? Because during REM sleep, activity to upper airway muscles declines, the airway often becomes more collapsible. And as it does, the severity of the desaturations worsen. REM episodes are also longer in duration, by and large, than their non-REM counterparts. And it's because of both the increase in length of REM sleep apnea, as well as the degree of upper airway obstruction, that we often see worsening of sleep apnea in a patient with predominantly obstructive sleep apnea during REM sleep. In contrast, this patient has three REM periods where the apneic activity gets better. Yes, the O2 saturation goes down a bit, but the intermittent hypoxia, the variability that we see in this oxygen saturation signal gets less in REM sleep compared to adjacent segments of non-REM sleep. And that's true for all three of these REM episodes. By the way, this is a patient who doesn't snore very much, and most of the noise is related to body position changes, 
rather than snoring per se. This is someone who has more apnea during non-REM and it gets better during REM sleep. And indeed, the numbers will bear that out. And it's in fact the patient with central and chain stroke breathing patterns that oftentimes improve, improve during REM compared to non-REM sleep. And so we've got a lot of clues for obstructive sleep apnea in the top panel where the REM periods themselves have worsening of the apnea compared to the non-REM. There's snoring that's emblematic of obstruction. And we haven't mentioned yet that the pulse rate variability is being driven primarily by the apneic activity, not by a cardiac arrhythmia. And so what we see here is severe apnea in REM sleep with an AHI of 83 an hour. In non-REM sleep, the AHI is 96 an hour. And no central sleep apnea really to speak of. Less than 10% of the episodes are actually central in nature. In contrast, the patient in the bottom panel has relative absence of sleep apnea during REM sleep. The REM sleep apnea gets better. There's little snoring, both of which speak strongly for chain soak and central sleep apnea. And indeed, what we see is on the tabular data, two-thirds of the events are classified as central episodes, and two-thirds are actually associated with periodic breathing or chain stoke respiration that is automatically scored. By the way, the pulse rate variability exists regardless whether the patient's having apnea during non-REM or little apnea during REM or wakefulness. And this pulse rate variability is more reflective of an underlying arrhythmic rather than microarousals from the apnea themselves. This is a patient with atrial fibrillation, which provides us the cardiac substrate for the development of chain stroke breathing, predominantly during non-REM sleep. Now, as we learn how to take a deep dive into the recording, we will also be able to distinguish states of upper airway obstruction during sleep that may vary from a completely patent airway, partially obstructed hypopnic airway, to a completely closed upper airway. And it's on that basis that we see three patterns of snoring, two patterns of snoring, one of which shows progressive crescendo in snoring just prior to the reciprocal pattern of the arousal from sleep. And that is a hypopnea where there's some degree of airflow but partial upper airway obstruction during sleep. Whereas these patterns of respiratory silence leading to a resuscitative snort at the arousal, these are the at patterns that that indicate that the patient has a completely shut or closed airway or a complete obstructive apnea rather than a hypopnea. We can also look at the recordings themselves to confirm the presence of central sleep apnea and chain stroke breathing. And you see that with the reciprocal pattern. But that pattern, the microarousal from sleep, terminates these periods with absent respiratory movement. There's a respiratory silence here, indicating that the patient is not exerting effort and is having a central apnea. And as is often the case in chain stroke breathing, there's a waxing and waning pattern of ven ventilation. And that's shown here in the oximetry signal, where we can see that the resaturation, the upgoing slope, is very consistent and roughly the same as the downward slope in the O2 saturation curve. When we see a real periodicity or sinusoidal nature of the oxygen saturation, we really are looking at the patterns that are often indicative of chain stoke or central sleep apnea. So in summary, where we've come here is we're looking very closely at the automated score results. And we're looking specifically at the graphic display, generating our own impressions 
the hypnogram and the sleep disorder breathing severity and using our visual impressions to cross-check the tabular data, confirm, verify, or do a deep dive with targeted insight as to which portions of the recording we might want to look at before we generate our final report. So I'd like to illustrate this pattern as we go into a really graphic example of a 53-year-old man who is morbidly obese with a BMI of 81.7. And in this middle-aged fellow who has a very, very high BMI, we might a priori generate a few questions. He certainly has sleep disorder breathing. We will want to confirm its severity in terms of the level of AHI. He could be a Pickwick, and he could, because of Pickwickian syndrome, have central or chain stoke breathing rather than obstructed, obstructive sleep apnea. Well, the Pickwickian syndrome with an elevation in, in daytime CO2 and a reduction in daytime oximetry, when they go off to sleep, their oximetry signal oftentimes goes down throughout the night. In other words, oxygenation does not recover. And in fact, as we look at this fellow's hypnogram, We've already seen this patient earlier in the talk. We can see that the patient indeed has severe sleep apnea. We've answered our first question. The second question, does the oxygen saturation recover during sleep? And the answer is yes, it does. During sleep, it recovers into the mid-90s. So this is a patient that does not appear to be a gross grossly hypoventilating with long stretches of baseline steady state, state desaturations over the course of the night. And our third question really has to do with, is this patient, does this patient predominantly have obstructive versus central apneic episodes? And as noted before, we see that airway obstruction is highlighted by the finding that this patient is snoring quite a bit but it's also emphasized by the instances that we draw that the obstruction may be worse in some of the REM sleep cycles compared to the non -REM. To confirm these patterns, we can go into the recording itself. And what we're showing here is a 10-minute screenshot in non-REM sleep. And I'd like to point out that the whole hypnogram for the entire night appears on the top panel. And what we see immediately below is the actograph, body position, oximetry, PAT signal, the amplitude of the PAT signal, and the pulse rate. And you can see that in this 10-minute stretch, we see the reciprocal pattern is in evidence 15 or 16 times. And it's characterized by a marked attenuation of the PAT amplitude and a concomitant rise in the pulse rate. These are the microarousals that terminate the apnea. Now, those microarousals are associated, each and every one of them, with a significant DSAT. But at the end of these microarousals, we see that breathing resumes, indicating a period of respiratory silence during the event, and at the arousal, the resumption of breathing. And we see that breathing resumes in both the snore signal as well as in the actigraphy signal, where you can see in addition to the movement, there's the resumption of respiratory efforts. Well, this is a patient who has obstructive episodes, but hand in hand with the pattern of upper airway obstruction is that we see that there's a very slow DSAT but abruptly at the arousal itself, the resaturation is very, very steep and is in fact much steeper than the desaturation itself. That abrupt arousal leading to airway reopening and the sudden resumption of, vent of ventilation leads to a very sharp rise in oxygen saturation. 
In other words, the O2 fat signal is anything but sinusoidal. It's asymmetric with a gradual BSAT and an abrupt peak resaturation. So we've got abundant evidence that this is not only a patient who has severe apnea, by the way, 15 episodes in a 10 minute stretch becomes an AHI of roughly 90 episodes an hour. We'll cross check that in a moment. But we've also answered another question in one quick screen screenshot. And that is that we see all the features of obstructive and not central apneic episodes in the profile of the oximetry, the abrupt resumption of snoring at the arousal, and the reflection of that respiratory activity in the actograph itself. Well, we can confirm all of these features as we look at the AHI of 90 episodes or so an hour, an ODR that is also 90, and very low percentage of central compared to obstructive episodes. So this is a patient with severe apnea, obstructive apnea, no clear evidence of alveolar hypoventilation during sleep, and all the features of obstruction with worsening of the apnea in REM and, in, and snoring throughout the night indicative of the fact that this is a patient whose upper airway is very collapsible during sleep. Well, we'll contrast this patient with another 75-year-old man who presents at a relatively normal BMI with no sleepiness, severe apnea with an AHI 44. He's on oral appliance therapy, and a watch pad study is done on the oral appliance itself. We've got to figure out whether the appliance is relieving his sleep apnea and his upper airway obstruction. And we've already seen this graphic display where this is the individual whose sleep apnea improves in REM sleep compared to adjacent areas of non-REM sleep, where we see very fine but repeated desaturations in non-REM sleep that get better in REM sleep and, once again, worsen in non-REM. As mentioned, he doesn't have much snoring, which goes against there being a large obstructive apnea component here. And the fact that the intermittent hypoxia improves in REM suggests the reason might be that he is predominantly a chain stoke breather during non-REM with improvement in chain stoke breathing that are characteristic of chain stoke during REM sleep. But when we look at this patient and we, we look at his report, we've summarized the features where our visual impressions can be confirmed by the automated tabular results, where we find he has rather severe AHI, an elevation in AHI to 43 an hour, but markedly improved reductions in AHI and REM sleep at seven an hour compared to non-REM at 47 an hour. And as noted, this patient has about two thirds to three quarters of his events are actually classified as central in nature. Now, if we wanna confirm the, the central apnea nature of his sleep disorder breathing. We'll do a deep dive into the recording. And I'll highlight that with just simply one five minute screenshot where there's no snoring whatsoever, background levels of noise at 40 decibels. The respiratory movement center uh, uh, sensor shows us this waxing and waning pattern of ventilation with the cessation of ventilation highlighted with the horizontal double arrow, punctuated by hypertonic periods with a waxing and waning pattern of ventilation. And with that waxing and waning pattern, we see that the oximetry signal shows the same sort of symmetric desaturation and resaturation that is characteristic more of chain stoke 
representative of an obstructive apnea episode. Now, this patient has the microarousal from sleep that are characterized by the attenuation in pad amplitude, the marked vasoconstriction, that are accompanying the desaturation field. But because of underlying atrial fibrillation and the irregularities in the pulse rate that you see here, you can see that the pulse rate itself is highly irregular, and it's unable to show us what would be typically the reciprocal pattern. Nonetheless, the episodes of microarousal in association with the disturbances in these two respiratory signals are indicative of sleep disorder breathing episodes leading to recurrent microarousals from sleep. So what I'd like to do here is really summarize the features of chain soak and central sleep apnea that appear on the report, namely that non-REM AHI is considerably worse than REM AHI, that the O2 saturations are regular, desaturations are regular and periodic, and that the dips, dip, that the O2 sat dips to a consistent native. And we oftentimes find that chain stoke breathing is associated with atrial fibrillation, in which case we'll see the irregularities in the pulse rate itself. But we can confirm all these features in the, re in the recording by seeing that there's a loss of respiratory effort in the chest movement sensors. There's symmetric fluctuations in all of the respiratory signals, namely the symmetric fluctuations in oximetry and waxing and waning respiratory effort. We haven't commented, but circulation time can be measured on these recordings and shows you in many instances a prolongation in the transit time of blood that courses from the lungs through the left heart and out to the finger oximetry. And then finally, we haven't focused particularly for lack of time, but the arousals themselves occur at the apex of the crescendo phase in hyperpnea after the arousal, not necessarily at the instant that the apnea is actually terminated. So I'd like to summarize that we've got a structured approach to analyzing the watch pad study. And it starts with the report in which we observe and visually draw our inferences from the graphs themselves. We do a plausibility check on the hypnogram and on the severity and type of sleep disorder breathing episode. And we use that graphic display to drive our inferences and our questions as we cross-check our impressions with the visual, with the tabular data, and use those impressions to target specific areas in the recording that warrant a deep dive to confirm aspects of the hypnogram or the sleep, or sleep disorder breathing type or severity. When we look at the recording, we're doing much something that's very different from our review of the polysomnography, and that we're looking at that recording in a selective fashion, and only a few screens are usually warranted to confirm or edit the hypnogram or the sleep disorder breathing episode. We've learned that we can stage sleep grossly in one to two hour screens in the recording, and we can verify or edit the sleep disorder breathing event in 10 to 15 minute screens. And it's from these screens that we can recognize specific features of sleep disorder breathing episodes, namely positional sleep apnea, REM dependent sleep apnea, sleep stage effects in snoring and intermittent hypoxia that distinguish the patient with central from obstructive sleep apnea. We've also seen in the recordings themselves that we can confirm the presence of central episodes 
and we can distinguish between apneas and hypopnea. We haven't yet, due to the shortness of time, talked about rearers, arrhythmias, and periodic limb movements, as well as other non-respiratory sleep disorders. That may be for a later time, but nonetheless rest assured that the watch pack itself as a recording platform saves time by virtue of the fact that it's automated. It renders unusually so, an unusual characteristic is that it provides us with sleep architecture as well as sleep disorder breathing metrics. The recordings themselves can be edited and there are formal scoring guidelines that allow you to verify and edit the watch pad reports and recording. And it's really on that basis that I would highlight at a high level the overall findings of the COMPASS project, which really brings us back to the comparison of the watch pad, the standard in-lab polysomnography, where both of these studies were recorded simultaneously in patients who presented to the sleep laboratory. And I'd like to give a shout out to the fellow who did the heavy lifting for this study, Zhi Gang Zhang, who is now back in Beijing and perhaps listening in the middle of his night to our, our presentation. Zhi Gang has really collated and analyzed these watch pad re reports and compared them directly to the polysomnograms themselves. He developed the rules for validating the watch pad and for editing the watch pad reports. And in the end of the day, yielded a result which, which generated formal scoring guidelines that allowed us to take a very good result from the watch pad and improve upon it even further. And his results are highlighted in the correlation between the edited watch pad recording and the formal PSG result. And that our manual process of visually editing and lightly dusting off the automated result always led to some significant improvement in our ability to replicate the full in-lab polysomnogram result. And it's by virtue of that fact that I would encourage you to just simply become more familiar with the process that starts with the report, but allows you to implement formal scoring guidelines to improve upon even the automated results to render a better and more accurate result after a little bit of manual editing. Now that process really becomes particularly important in patients who meet the following criteria. Watchpad may return an AHI that's greater than 20 episodes an hour, but an oxygen desaturation index that is less than 20. When that discrepancy exists, I'm usually diving into the report and the recording itself to determine what is the reason for that discrepancy. And the reason often occurs in a patient with suspected arrhythmia, and we've seen the heart rate variability in those patients that characterize atrial fibrillation. Elderly patients may have more than one thing going on, such as periodic limb movements, that lead to a spurious increase in AHI compared to the ODI that may be quite low. But premenopausal women with upper airway resistance syndrome and a lot of rearing may well have a high AHI, but a somewhat lower ODI, simply because the premenopausal woman does not readily desaturate during non-REM sleep in particular. And so these are really the, the subgroups of people from the COMPASS studies that Xi Dong has found lead to warrant a, a little bit of extra attention in the recording itself and lead to improvements in accuracy when we look at the recording and edit those recordings relative to the report, the automated report itself. What I think we're highlighting in the end of the day is that there is yet some learning that can be done 
And there are additional webinars at your disposal that will allow you to examine other cases which highlight and will improve upon your skills in identifying the patterns that we've highlighted here to determine both the severity and type of sleep disorder breathing, as well as use the WatchPath device to detect non-respiratory disturbances such as periodic leg movement. And in the end of the day, when you're looking at these recordings and reports, you're, com you're combining your understanding of respiratory and neurophysiology along with your clinical intuitions and understanding of sleep disorders, and finally, a basic ability to recognize the patterns that you see in the signals themselves, it's these three components in your knowledge base that conspire to render a diagnosis that is more accurate and leads to greater and greater degrees of diagnostic clarity. So I'd like to stop there and really uh, pause for a moment and ask the audience whether there are any questions that you would like to discuss. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much for sharing an informative presentation. Um, as Dr. Schwartz said, we are about to begin the audience Q&A. If you haven't already, please input your questions into the Q&A chat box. This webinar is being recorded and the follow-up email that tomorrow will include a link to the recording. And be sure to take the course evaluation, which will appear on your screen after the webinar ends. First, a word from sponsor Itamar Medical. Award-winning WatchPat One is a fully disposable, single-use home sleep apnea test with the same level of accuracy and reliability of all WatchPat products. It provides a comprehensive auto score report immediately after the study is completed with AHI, central AHI, RDI, and ODI based upon true sleep time and sleep staging. It utilizes a simple smartphone app to transmit the study data. Immediately after the study is completed, results will be ready to review by the clinician. Thanks to WatchPat One's single-use design, it helps to eliminate the risk of infection both for clinics and patients. If you have an interest in learning more about WatchPat products, please visit itamar-medical.com. Now let's take our first audience question. How does WatchPat detect hypopneas? So WatchPat itself and its current embodiment does not specifically distinguish between apneas and hypopnea. But as I illustrated uh, in the talk itself, you can distinguish between apneas and hypopneas very easily and get and generate a guesstimate as to whether you have a patient with a predominance of either hypopnea or apnea. And you can do that on the basis of the snoring pattern where hypopneas themselves are associated with crescendo increases in snoring leading up to the arousal from sleep. Whereas apneas are characterized by respiratory silence up until the arousal, and the arousals during an obstructive apnea are characterized by a sudden explosive snore or snorting sound. The other thing that you have available to you is you can look at the respiratory movement sensor. And the movement sensor will allow you to distinguish whether there has been a cessation of effort, as in the case of a complete apnea, a complete central apnea, a crescendo increase in effort during the event that might characterize the obstructive apnea, or cessation of effort with a hypopnea at the termination that indicates that the patient is having a chain stoke or central episode. So you've got a lot of signals and signal characteristics that can help you gain say whether a patient has predominantly hypopnea or apnea and distinguish which type. Excellent. And you're uh, welcome to move it to the next slide, by the way, for the Q&A, for the rest of the Q&A. Uh, next question, how does PAT detect central sleep apnea? So as mentioned, I think we're, PAT itself 
looks at some subtle physiologic markers that have to do with the ability mm -hmm. to see the presence of upper airway obstruction in 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 the chain in a change in the upstroke of the pulsatile signal during systole. In that during systole, the upstroke of the pulse waveform changes depending on whether your airway is obstructed, in which case you're tugging respiratory, you're, you're generating a vigorous respiratory effort that tugs blood back away from the finger and into the chest when you're breathing in deeply against an obstructed airway. That's how watch pad does. You can do it visually a lot easier, primarily because we've got the respiratory sensor, the movement sensor, that tells us whether the patient stopped breathing or not, as they might during a, a central apneic episode. You have the regular periodicity in all the respiratory signals that give you the flavor of chain stoke breathing. And you've got the snoring signal, which tells you whether the episodes are occurring against the backdrop of a lot of snoring or upper airway obstruction during sleep. So we've got loads of confirmation that indicates whether a patient is predominantly obstructive or central in nature. We've also spoken about the sleep stage effects on chain stoke breathing that differ from the predominantly REM-related effects of worsening obstructive sleep apnea. How does WatchPAT address variation in pulse with atrial fibrillation? Would Raynaud's affect the signal? So let's take that in two parts. First, you can see the variability in the pulse in the pulse wave signal that is generated from, from the PAT signal itself. So that variability, when it's irregularly irregular, oftentimes indicates that, there's, that the patient has atrial fibrillation. And you can see that that variability changes over the course of the night. In some cases, it changes as a function of sleep stage. In other cases, you can see paroxysmal atrial fibrillation rear its head over the course of the night. But all bets are off in patients with Raynaud's disease, primarily because Raynaud's is characterized by alterations in the peripheral vasculature in the finger, and you might not see the same sorts of dynamic fluctuations in the pad amplitude or in the pad waveform in the patient who has Raynaud's. And so Raynaud's may, may, may constitute a relative contraindication to the watch pad. In the paper published by the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine, it states that the watch pad 200 underestimates events by six per hour at 4%. Is this correct and is this being addressed? Yeah, the underestimation is by about four or five events per hour um, in the um, in the current uh, in the WatchPat 200 reporting. Um, in the WatchPat 300, we've got an additional signal where we namely have the respiratory motion sensor, which can play into WatchPat's automated estimate of sleep disorder breathing severity or AHI. But I would also highlight that the automated reports, regardless whether it's WatchPAT 200 or 300, the automated reports that we're, we're really targeting for visual overreading in a more detailed fashion are those in which the AHI might be high, but the ODI is relatively low. Using roughly speaking the threshold of 15 or 20 episodes an hour, when AHI exceeds that level and ODI falls below it, those are reports and recordings that I think you're going to want to take a, a little bit deeper dive into in order to verify whether, in fact, the AHI that is estimated to be somewhat higher 
whether it can be confirmed by fluctuations in the other respiratory signals, not necessarily in the ODI. And so that discrepancy between HI and ODI, I would take down into the level of the recording, look at a few screenshots of a 10 to 15 minute view, and take a look and see whether you're seeing the distinct changes in snoring patterns or respiratory movement that can confirm the presence of those microarousals, confirm that those microarousals are the reciprocal pattern that we've highlighted, is specifically related to a sleep disordered breathing episode. Thank you. Uh, to finish on time today, I want to conclude by saying thank you to our presenters, our sponsor, Itamar Medical, and to our audience members. Uh, we are passing along your additional questions to Itamar Medical, um, who may be able to answer them offline for you. Um, you can also visit their website for contact information uh, for additional questions. Uh, feel free to continue typing them in for the next minute or so so we can pass them along. Um, also, you may email me at sroy at medcore.com with comments, questions, and future webinar suggestions, or if you watch today's event for at least 60 minutes but don't receive your certificate within 30 days. You can visit us at www.sleepreviewmag.com. Thank you for participating in the Sleep Review webinar. Thank you.